Good afternoon, and um, welcome to the Friends of Minuteman Winter Lecture Series. Um, we're delighted to present Radical Spirits, the Material Culture of Drinking at Minuteman National Historical Park with park curator Nikki Walsh. And of course, I realized this week that it's the first week of spring. Um, but I assure you this made sense at the time when I was planning the winter lecture series this fall um, that February, March still seemed like winter to me. Um, so I, I apologize. And I, thankfully, this was not prophetic. And we, we had rain yesterday instead of snow. Um, but um, I'm so excited to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming out um, on this very cold spring day. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about the Friends of Minuteman National Park. I see a lot of familiar faces, um, but I see some new faces too, so I wanted to let you know um, a little bit more about the Friends. We are the official nonprofit partner of Minuteman National Historical Park, and we focus on supporting events, education, and preservation at the park. Um, now, we have a table outside the room, so if you'd like to learn more about the Friends, sign up for our monthly email newsletter, um, grab a free coaster for yourself and for um, a couple friends. We've got plenty of coasters there. Um, we also have opportunities if you'd like to sign up for membership. And very importantly, with the 250th anniversary of the beginning of the American Revolution coming up, um, we have um, donation opportunities. Um, we're inviting people to donate um, $250 for the 250th. And this is to help support all of the different um, anniversary events that are happening at the park. Um, the 250th anniversary really starts now um, at the park in 2024 and will go all the way through um, the 2030s um, with the end of the Revolutionary War. So we've got a lot of great um, events for you at the park and with the friends. Um, and the friends are really proud to be a major supporter of Patriots Day 2024 and 25th anniversary events. Um, okay, now we're ready for the main event. Um, today, we're so excited to host Nikki Walsh, um, Minuteman National Historical Parks curator, um, for her lecture, Radical Spirits, the Material Culture of Drinking at Minuteman National Historical Park. Um, Nikki Walsh is the curator, and she's worked for the National Park Service since 2009 and has worked with over 45 parks as a museum specialist in the Northeast region. Her area of expertise is material culture and decorative arts of the 18th um, of 18th century New England. She received a BS in public history and geology from Salem State University and an MA in historical archaeology from Boston University. Um, she's been at Minuteman National Historical Park since 2018 and first fell in love with the park on a school field trip in the fifth grade. Um, who else went to the, who else came to the park in fifth grade on a field trip? Anyone else? A couple of us. If you're local, that's what you do. You come to the park in fifth grade. So Nikki, we welcome you, and thank you for being here today. Yeah, it's up to you. All right. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see so many faces. Um, as Kathleen so nicely introduced me, I'm Nikki Walsh, the museum curator over at Minuteman National Historical Park. And yeah, I really did visit it on my fifth grade field trip. Um, and I remember it vividly. My husband actually worked at the park. So it has a very special place in my heart as well as I'm sure many of yours. Um, so this is my first lecture post COVID. The last lecture that I gave was the Friends Lecture in 2020, February of 2020. Um, so this is really exciting. Um, I joke that they don't let me out of the basement, but here I am. Um, so I'm so excited to chat more, and we'll have some time at the end for questions. So getting started, this boisterous bunch right here. Radical spirits, the material culture of drinking at Minuteman National Historical Park. So that bio was great, but I included one in here too, just with a couple little fun facts about myself. So. Shout out Salem State History Department. Um, I went to Boston University for archaeology. I am classically trained as an archaeologist, um, but I have been in curatorial work for almost 15 years in the National Park Service. Uh, 
areas of expertise, we kind of talked all about these. Historic ceramics is a big one. Um, I do a lot of social media. And if you see any pop culture or Taylor Swift posts on the Minuteman page, I was definitely responsible for part of that. Um, so one of the things that I love most about my job is I get to work with artifacts and I get to show these artifacts off to a whole new audience of people. Um, it's, it's really awesome and I feel very lucky. People always ask, what is your favorite artifact to find? And I hate this question, because I don't have one, and it really does change, right? I've been in this field for 15 years. I'm a mom, so my current favorite thing to find in the archaeology lab or in the ground is stuff to do with mothering. And the one that comes to mind is a glass nipple shield that was found in like an early 19th century context. Very, very cool. Not at Minuteman at another site, but I love anything that just really brings the artifacts back home to us um, and really reminds us that a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same. My mom's out there who breastfed, no. So um, my least favorite artifact to find are teeth. Animal teeth, human teeth, they're not cute. I don't love finding them. Um, I have cataloged hundreds and hundreds of thousands of teeth in my life. So, And you'll see my email address is on here. I go by Nikki. Nobody calls me Nicole. Um, but my email address is Nicole underscore Walsh. So, that'll... Minuteman National Historical Park. How many of you here have been to Minuteman National Park? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I like to see. So um, you can see here we have historic sites, um, recreation area, bicycling trail, the Battle Road Trail is one of my favorite places to run, except this time of year in the mud season. Um, and we are here located at this star. So quite close to the park. So if anyone didn't raise your hand, here's your official. You should check it out. All right. So let's dive right in. The park was established in 1959 and has been collecting since the early 1960s, especially when it comes to archaeology. We have a huge um, component of archaeology in our collection as long as as well as archives and so you'll see here this is archives totaling about 300 just shy of 300,000 and we have archaeology over here um, is about 285,000 objects so total we have almost 600,000 artifacts we also have some history objects that joins the collection from 1965 and onwards that are associated with the Wayside, home of authors. Those are largely 19th and 20th century objects. And when we refer to history objects, that might seem kind of like a silly term, but we're referring to tables and chairs and all of the stuff that kind of fills a home. So if you were to visit the Wayside, those objects are categorized as history objects. I've included a few examples here. This beautiful piece right here is a men's wallet from the 1770s that's in our collection. Um, so that's a good representation of a history object, right? It's a personal object. We have this book of Psalms right here. And um, that's an example of an archival artifact. Um, we have everything from postcards to photos to you name it, newspaper clippings, you name it, we have it in the collections. Um, so this book of Psalms is one from Minuteman that I particularly liked. And this right here is a bone object. Um, it is actually the handle of a um, 18th century fork. And you can see it's been decorated, incised decoration on the handle. So those are just three out of the almost 600,000 objects that we have in our collection. And for those of you who have been following the Great American Outdoors Act work, we are likely to get over 600,000 with the archaeological surveys that have been done associated with that. So um, tons and tons of stuff in our collections. There's something for everybody. So if anyone out there is looking for a research project, we probably have something for you. All right, so let's get into the meat of it. We're gonna be talking about material culture of drinking. So this means we're gonna be talking about different material types. The different material types we're gonna cover, we're gonna cover glass. How can you talk about drinking without talking about glassware? We got bottles, stemware, tumblers, decanters and stoppers, goblets, etc. 
We're going to be focusing on the 1770s thereabout. When you get into the um, Victorian era, they invented 400 other style vessels to hold alcohol. So you might have, you might be like, oh, well, what about this vessel? Uh, maybe a little bit later than than what our scope is today. So we'll be focusing on um, beautiful glassware like this. This tumbler right here is um, an example from the Victoria and Albert Museum collection. You'll be seeing a lot of that because their online database is Chef's Kiss, amazing. So um, this right here, it looks kind of modern. That's actually why I chose this one. It dates to about 1740 to 1760, so definitely something that would have been on the table, say, at Hartwell Tavern. Um, and this other um, piece of stemware right here, beautiful, beautiful piece, also from the Victoria and Albert Museum, is dated to 1770. So we will cover glass in depth, but I want to jump over and just highlight ceramics also. Ceramics, you're going to find forms like punch bowls, mugs, tankards, drink storage, steins, the typical things that we tend to think of when we think of drinking, right? Those big, like, German steins with the metal lids. We don't find too many of those, but um, punch bowl fragments, uh, mug fragments. We have, we have some of those in our collection. This example of a punch bowl is from, um, again, the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's Worcester porcelain, circa 1765. Um, again, something that would have um, been used by, by the um, colonists in the 18th century here. Uh, this piece is Worcester porcelain, so it's, it's British. Other materials. So where our talk today is going to be focused on glass and ceramics, because that's what we have. Um, the collection doesn't really boast any, like, Silver tankards, that would have been awesome, right? I was, I went looking for those. Not even any pewter tankards, so like a metallic wares. Um, we don't have any wood tumblers or anything like that. No leather, um, they would make mugs out of leather. We don't have any of those, but I just want you to know that they do exist, um, or they did exist. So along with that, I won't be covering the um, distilling and manufacture of alcohol, but there's an archeological, um, Connection to all of that, too. They found taps from kegs in Williamsburg. So we know a lot about um, the drinking habits. But in order for us to not be here for two weeks straight, we're going to be have a very tight scope of the 1770s in this area. All right. Age is just a number, unless, of course, you happen to be a bottle of wine. Joan Collins, thank you for this quote. Um, so, wine bottles. English wine bottles, like the ones that you see on this slide here, can actually be dated. And this is because we have documentary evidence of how these bottles are manufactured. In addition to, in the Guide of Artifacts for Colonial America, Ivor Noel Hume goes through and studies English wine bottles in depth and actually makes a typology so that when we excavate them and we put them back together, we can get an approximate date on these bottles. That is like a gold mine for archaeologists. We love being able to date things specifically. So for this talk, um, this is one of the guides that I used. Uh, again, this only is about English wine bottles, um, this, this specific typology here. Um, if you were to go find some French wine bottles, I'm sure it would differ. But the grand scheme of things, in the 17th century, so the 1600s, stay close to the mic, the uh, wine bottle shape was like an onion. It was like a squat onion. It looks like I'm doing the hands, the, the Taylor Swift hands. But it was like a squat onion, right? That's not really easy to transport. So during the early 18th century, they were like, we need to find a better way to transport these things and store wine so that when it gets all the way to America, it tastes like they want it to taste. So the, the, you see the evolution of the wine bottle going from kind of short, squat, to more tall and cylindrical, cylindrical like we have today. <laughs> Bottles. So in this presentation, if you don't see a little white label that says Victoria and Albert Museum or a, a source of where it is, it's in the Minuteman collection. 
So this is actually two separate bottles that are in the Minuteman collection. And we're going to be seeing a lot of archaeology today, which means we're not going to have those complete bottles or those complete tankards. Uh, so we're going to have to do a little bit of digging. Are you, are you ready for this? OK, that's what I like to hear. So before we get too deep, I'm going to give you the parts of a bottle so you can impress your friends at parties. Bottle, this is an English um, wine bottle here. They're usually dark olive green in color, dark green. Um, they're prolific at um, historical archaeology sites because people, A, loved wine. They, had a, they could contain other beverages too. But you could also reuse these bottles. So um, I, I jokingly refer to it as like a Stanley of their day. Um, but we find a lot of fragments of bottles like this. So it has a lip. You'll see up here. I really hoped I had a pointer, but I don't. So the lip is up here. We call this the neck of the bottle. This is the shoulder. We zoom over to this bottle over here. Continuation of the shoulder. This is the body. This is the base. And the base looks a little different than the modern um, wine bottle base. So you can see the pontal scar, which is where the um, glass blow rod was actually broken off from the bottle so that it would be able to stand alone. And rather than just being flat on the bottom, um, it, it would tend to fall over or be uneven. They would push up the center. So you do still see that in wine bottles today, but there was a really big what they call kick up. Um, which I always joke made less wine in the bottle. So manufacturers must have loved that. Um, the glass bottle that you see here, based on just what I was saying about short and squat as opposed to long and cylindrical, this does predate my talk a little bit. This is probably 1740s or 1750s, um, but still a stunning example of um, classic English wine bottle. And you'll see that there are air bubbles. This is a hand-blown bottle. They would have been manufacturing these as quickly as possible. They're definitely not perfect, uh, but it gets the job done, right? Right. So we're going to swerve. We're going to go get in our cars and take a trip to Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's not that far. Um, so how many of you have been to this national park site, the Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters? Yes, it's such a great house. Um, I was privileged to work at this house and many others. I barely see you with the Stanley. Um, when I was a museum specialist for the Northeast region, um, I was able to do some geophysical work in the yard. I just love this place. And when I first started working in the National Park Service in the archaeology lab, this was one of the projects that was available for me to learn and to just, you know, get my hands dirty, if you will, right? So... The National Park Service Northeast Museum Services Center was processing this deposit. So in 2001, Longfellow Washington's headquarters wanted to um, use the basement more effectively for their collection storage area. So they um, did some construction work. And prior to construction, what do we do? We do archaeology to make sure we're not messing up deposits just like this. So. The house served as Washington's headquarters from July of 1775 to April of 1776. The basement down here, this image here, was renovated to add space in 2001. And this is the archaeology that was done just in a small area. We're not doing massive excavations. We're just looking, this is the area that's going to be disturbed. This is the area that we want to excavate. So the bottles that you see in these images here, they were kind of stuck in mortar because um, they were in the floor here. They turned out to be about um, 20 different bottles. And you're like, how, did you, how do you know that, right? We do something called a minimum vessel count in archaeology. So for the wine bottles, wine bottles have one neck, right? We know this. So if you have 20 necks, the minimum number of wine bottles you can have is 20. There could be more, but there isn't less. So um, did a minimum vessel count. The bottles dated to the late 18th century. They were kind of a little all over the place. But remember, we did talk about this wasn't an exact science of bottle making. They were cranking these things out for the American market real quickly. So we have about 20 bottles dating to the late 18th century. In addition to the broken glass that was clearly just thrown into this 
um, area as waste. Um, they also found seeds such as muskmelon seeds, apple and pear seeds, or possibly cucumber seeds, eggshells, an olive pit, and cherry stones. So were they Washington's bottles? Well, Ebenezer Austin, who was the steward for George Washington while he was at Longfellow House, notes that he ordered cherries in August of 1775. There are also notes um, from the entire encampment that he ordered apples, pears, cucumbers, and musk melons for Washington while he was encamped there. So we can't definitively say these bottles were George Washington's. However, there's a really good chance. Um, the architecture of this space, the house was built in, um, excuse me, in 1759. So we know that it had to be at least between 1759 and 1791 because a later portion was added. So we not only knew when this deposit started, we knew when it ended. It was only a 32 year section of history, which for archeology span is nothing. Um, I think it, it could have been any of the families living here at that time, but in my heart, I like to believe these were Washington's bottles. Um, so again, down the street in Cambridge, not far away at all, definitely similar to the type of um, consumption habits, both money consumption and alcohol consumption um, that we see here in Concord, Lexington, and Lincoln. So, <laughs> yeah, but wait, there's more. Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about how at Minuteman, we have these small fragments. We're not, I don't have whole bottles or whole stemware to show you. I have to be a detective, right? I have to say, all right, well, we have this little piece here. What could that have gone to? When does that date till? So as an archeologist, I know that this is acid etched glass. Um, I know it was likely from a tumbler and this specific example comes from the Case House site, which we've been doing a lot of work on. Um, to me, I just, I mean, like it says to me in its own secret language, like I'm 18th century. So I just, you know, I've been with these artifacts a long time, but I was able to find a very similar example from the Victoria and Albert Museum, which they date to the late 18th century. Um, so that's always really reassuring to me that I'm able to go and find these objects, do the research, and we have more information about them than we weren't normally would have. But wait, there's more. So, eagle eyes, this is a stemware foot in our collection. And um, I wish we had more of it, but this just tells you that even though we're not finding like the full pieces like the Victoria and Albert Museum has, we were still seeing these goods out here during the 1770s. That one's my favorite. So. Um, we have a stopper, but we don't have the fancy decanter. Of course, the first thing that they lose is the stopper, right? Especially once you start drinking. So this is an example of a claret bottle, right? The, um, from It's actually dated, so it's 1762. I love when they write the dates on things. That helps tremendously. And is just an example of what um, the stopper could have gone to. So shout out to the V&A Museum for providing these um, beautiful pieces to to complete our pictures. So I hope you enjoyed our ride through glass, bottles, stemware, drinkware, decanters. Now we get to the ceramic vessels. And this is really, I wrote my master's thesis on ceramics. I'm all about ceramics. They tell us so much. And we have a lot of documented history of exactly when they were producing these ceramics and types. Um, and I just came off of the Colonial Williamsburg Ceramics Conference. It gave me 100,000 new ideas. Sorry in advance, Margie and Jared. Um, but it's, there's a lot of exciting research that's ongoing. It's certainly not a dead field. We're learning more and more every day, including one of the talks um, that they gave. They, found, they um, tracked the stoneware potter in New York. And, and for hundreds of years, they'd known about this potter. They didn't know that he was a free black man. So they had been writing this history as if he was a white man producing stoneware in New York in the 18th century. That's a dramatically different story than a person of color producing stoneware in New York City and having this, this business. So always learning, constantly evolving. Ceramic drinking vessels. Oh. 
Even though ceramics break very easily, the sherds survive. They're survivors. So the majority of archaeological collections are ceramics and glass. We have a ton of ceramics. Everything from redwares, um, which are earthenwares, like the terracotta pots that you see, to glazed redwares that would hold water, like this example right here. Um, those are earthenwares. There's three different types of ceramics that we're looking at. Earthenwares, stonewares, like I just mentioned, and porcelain. And they all kind of have their own use. But don't worry, we have examples of all of those in this talk. So these are pretty common utilitarian drinking vessels. Um, the redware with the um, exterior glazed, we have a couple of those in the collection. This was something that could either be produced locally and sold and, um, or could be produced in England and brought over here. So these type of wares are prolific on um, American archeological sites, especially in the Northeast. They did break easily, but as you can see, they survive relatively well in our acidic soil, unlike bones and other things um, that degrade. So we are able, in a lot of cases, to put them back together, see what they were, and really just learn as much as we possibly can. When we're talking about ceramics, we are talking about the body, which is the interior. That's what the ceramic is made out of, either earthenware, porcelain, or stoneware. The glaze, in this case, it's a lead glaze. Um, lead glaze was super, super duper common. And yes, in the 18th century, they were aware um, of the, the issues of lead being in, in products that you were eating and drinking with. Um, but they, there is a mention in an 18th century cookbook about how they knew that putting acidic things in lead with a lead glazed dish was a bad idea. But for something like this that was like a more temporary, everything was glazed in lead. And then if you get real fancy, over here you have this trailed slipware. They would do a decoration with or on top of the glaze. So you could really make it your own, just like those acid etched um, examples that we had in the previous one, the glass. All right, and I listened to the pronunciation of, of Amphrotite. Someone who knows Greek mythology is gonna, is gonna tell me I did it wrong, but Neptune an Amphrotite mug. This is in the Minuteman collection. This is like one of my absolute favorite things ever. It's creamware, which is what I wrote my master's thesis on. And so that dates to about 1780, 1770s or 80s. And this has such a bold, awesome neoclassical motif. It could not be more in your face. And so I, um, to get a little bit of a background about Neptune and his wife, um, this original um, was, uh, excuse me, this was originally painted in the early 17th century. There's a painting um, of Neptune and Amphrotite um, in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It was later adapted into a variety of um, engravings. And so this is an engraving, the closest one that I could find to um, our Neptune. Here And you can see this is kind of what the full image would have looked like. The image was placed onto the mug um, with transfer printing. So the best way to explain that is they basically took this engraving, they printed it um, with a glaze on a piece of paper, they applied it to the wet clay, and they put it in the kiln, the paper burns off, and you're left with that ink design. Um, there's a couple other ways to do it, but that's temporary tattoo is is the easiest analogy to make to that. You just put it on, peel it off, you're left with the design. Um, so this is the closest engraving that I could find. But I did find the exact design. It just happens to be on a very low quality photo of this bowl. So this bowl, after doing a little bit of digging and going down a rabbit hole, is a bowl produced in Liverpool in 1789 with the same exact design as the one in Concord. We have a good idea where it came from. We have a good idea of when, when it dated to. What isn't obvious is what does this say if you're drinking out of this tall, I mean, it's about this big. What does this say to people around you, right? It's neoclassical. They were doing excavations at Herculaneum in um, Italy and Greece. They were learning all about the um, classic civilizations. 
they wanted to appear worldly. They wanted to appear genteel. This was really big, especially moving into, into the late 18th century, is your appearance and the goods that you have and what that said about your appearance. Making sure everyone's awake. Um, so, punch bowls are super duper fun. These, before anyone gets too excited, none of these are in our collection. They are in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, but I wanted to include these on this slide because punch bowls are fun. There's tons of personalized design that goes into them. They could be floral, they could be produced, um, transfer printed, like that other example. They could be on Chinese porcelain and make them super expensive. They could say success to Boston. They could say they were custom, right? So the sky was really the limit. We see awesome examples, um, sometimes written in the bottom of the bowl, like keep drinking, like fill, up, fill me up one more. Um, just things that really help to take the past and make you realize that we're not all that different than people living 250 years ago. So those are some beauties in the V&A, but don't worry. While we are reanalyzing re the Case House archaeology site, we found this base of a porcelain punch bowl. How big is it? That's a great question. So think of like a big serving bowl. Um, I'm just going to pop back here really quick because I had two more note cards that I forgot to read. I got excited. Okay, so punch. Punch is fun. We love punch. It's a communal beverage. So we just lived through a pandemic, so this just seems like the grossest thing ever. But um, you could have used a ladle or you could have just passed it around uh, as a communal beverage. And what goes into a punch recipe? Well, let's find out. Mount Vernon has made a punch recipe that um, appeals to modern audiences, and it has boiling water with tea, so we'll call it tea, black tea bags in it, rum, Brandy, apple brandy is what they suggested. Citrus, lemon and lime, spice, clove, allspice and cinnamon, and sugar. And that's a pretty authentic 18th century punch recipe. Um, speaking of punch, we're gonna we're gonna buzz right back to George Washington because George Washington rang up a very famous bar tab in 1787 in Philadelphia. So this bar tab included, and it was Washington and others, so not just him, but wait for it, 54 bottles of Madeira, 60 bottles of Claret, 8 bottles of whiskey, 22 bottles of Porter, 8 bottles of hard cider, 12 bottles of beer, and 7 bowls of punch. And again, the punch bowls are pretty, pretty sizable. How many people did they have? A thousand? No, no, they had 55 people at this party. <laughs> LOL. So, um, USA Today actually looked in depth um, at this, and there's a great article that I um, can link you to, but they um, looked at the archeology span of the city tavern and they kind of did the math. Not only would it have been a $15,000 bar tab in today's money, they do believe that this is legitimate. And um, the, the fun little like addition to the notes on how much um, alcohol was on this receipt is that they also had to pay for broken glasses. Because when you're drinking that much booze, there's bound to be broken glasses. So, what was the time? The time. Uh, how long? Oh, how long were they partying? Oh, I have to imagine all night, right? Like I have to, right? That was yeah. The article did say that Washington did like, you know, he had a tight ship, and he wasn't going to let people get crazy. So they think that like the few broken wine glasses were one thing, but he was gonna make sure that people weren't like destroying the place. So I like to think he was like the party mom. <laughs> All right, back to this beauty. So um, this has been in our collection since the 1960s and we are only just rediscovering it now because there are almost 300,000 objects in our collection and so many stories to tell. So this, is a porcelain bowl base, red and blue decoration. It's from the, uh, what we call now the Case House site between the Wayside and the Orchard House, right on Lexington Road in Concord. It's Amari Chinese porcelain, export porcelain. And this was not cheap. 
Um, if you had a punch bowl made of porcelain in the mid 18th century, which is around the, when this dates to, this signaled to others that you had money and you were there for a good time. Um, like I said, made during the 18th century, uh, a communal drinking bowl that would have looked something like this. Thank you, VNA. <laughs> um, so Chinese export porcelain comes onto the market in the, um, depending on where you are. And in the US, it's not until like the early 1700s. And it was really rare and it was really difficult to get, right? You obviously needed to go all the way to China, bring it back, or work through a trading company, which got a little bit tricky towards the 1770s in Boston, if you know what I mean. So access to these goods wasn't always available. And one of the things that the US wanted to do post-revolution was get a ship, and they did, from Philadelphia to um, Canton, China, to really bolster that trade, because they knew that this was where it was at. So this, this great bowl right here, um, I'm sad the whole thing didn't survive, but I am glad we have an example of the other one. So before you could drink your booze, you had to bring it with you to the party. And there was drink storage and transport vessels, specifically just for storage and transport. And this is where the stoneware comes in. So we've seen the earthenwares, we've seen the porcelain, the really fancy bowl. This is more utilitarian. If I were gonna relate this to dishes, I, I think of this as like the Tupperware, maybe the Pyrex, we'll give it that, container. This was for storage, this was for canned goods, this was for bringing things where you needed to go, and it was thick, it was heavy, it was produced quickly, but sometimes it was really pretty. Um, so this is Westerwald stoneware, and this is 18th century, this is probably about 1770s, so German stoneware, like this here, and the Bartman jugs, if you've ever seen those brown jugs with the faces on them, um, those were alcohol storage in, in this period. The Bartman jars were a little bit early. This is probably what they would have had in the 1770s for fancier drink storage and consumption. And to give you an example, that is um, technically a pitcher, right? So you can see how it would function as a pitcher. Um, it was produced in Germany for the American market circa 1770. We see a lot of these decorated with like King, King George. It was produced for the British and American markets. Um, you can see in this, it's kind of dappled on the exterior. It's a salt glaze. So what they'll do is they'll throw salt into the kiln as it's firing and it gives it an orange peel exterior. And that was just hugely popular on stoneware vessels. That's a great, that's a wonderful question. Not as much as you would think, because these are super thick vessels, right? Um, I don't know. I, c I imagine my stand, like 40 ounces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I said they made them pretty. They also made them very plain. Uh, these two examples, the brown one and the one in the middle, are both from the Minuteman collection. They are just utilitarian stoneware. The one, um, it could be painted brown, gray. Sometimes you see that cobalt blue decoration. This is a pretty rare jug um, from Boston, manufactured in Boston. This was manufactured both domestically and um, in England and other places. Getting towards the end of the 18th century though, Americans really wanted to focus on manufacturing their own goods and kind of getting away from being so reliant on other countries for these goods. So you see a boom in the stoneware industry in the 1770s in Boston. Charlestown is a um, big place for stoneware production as well as New York, New Jersey. New York really took the, took the name for that one, so. All right. You're like, Nikki, we've already done bottles. What are you doing? This is a special kind of bottle. So this is, a min in the Minuteman collection, you'll see it's labeled with its number. You may have noticed that throughout. That helps us keep track of everything. Um, this is a case bottle. It's neck, lip, and um, shoulder. It would have been straight-sided and closed with a cork. Right? Pretty simple, made in England, very similar to the English wine bottles. 
but this would have been used to hold gin or rum or whiskey. So this was more of a hard alcohol um, container. And you would actually be able to transport these based on the shape. So they had the, the flat sides. They weren't short and squat like those early um, wine bottles. These were made to go. So you'll see this is a um, case. These are 12 case bottles in a trunk um, from Christopher H. Jones Antiques. Very, very fancy. You never... I, I've seen this once in real, in real life with all the wine bottles in there. Um, I refer to this as the Colonial 12-pack, so <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, this, this was easily the most fun part of uh, researching this lecture, is there has been so much written about the consumption of alcohol during this period. And, as you can tell from the material culture, it was an everyday thing. People were drinking more frequently, but they were drinking much, much lower alcohol. Um, they were drinking more because water was contaminated with diseases, and when you distilled it or made it into um, beer, or whiskey, whatever, it killed the germs. So a lot more consumption, but I mean, George Washington did have that party with 55 of his, his friends. So there is some truth to this. Uh, and what I really want you to take away from this is more that they were engaged in what was going on at the time. They weren't necessarily booze bags like we would, you know, that's what I wrote on my, my index card. But this alcohol, the tea service, women taking tea, it was all intertwined with everyday life which was intertwined with consumerism, it was intertwined with politics always. Alcohol and politics always go together. I venture that tea and politics always go together too. Um, tea obviously involved in punch recipes. You can see that tea was so much more than just a beverage. We have the full tea service. I could have done a talk just the same for tea in Concord. It was hugely important. It was more than just a drink and it really, this um, idea of consumption of alcohol, consumerism, really played into um, what happened on April 19th. So before you can have the American Revolution, you need the consumer revolution. And this was a time in the mid 18th century in America and England where people, things were being produced much faster, it was a much lower cost. Even the middle classes were able to buy full sets of things. And really, the focus was on what do you want and not what you need. So there was a rise in consumer demand, and the industry met that demand. They changed the way they produced goods, specifically ceramics, glass, things of that nature, so that they could produce them more quickly to meet the demand and more cheaply so more people could afford these goods. So those punch bowls that I showed you, there's something there for every every price point, essentially, from porcelain, way high up at the top, all the way to like an earthenware that would have come from England. Um, everyone could be included in this. So it was much more wide reaching than just the, the gentry or the, the upper classes at this point in the 18th century. The increase in consumption during this, the 18th century would eventually lead to a reliance on these goods that king and parliament would then go on to tax, and the rest is history. Oh, I didn't want to do that yet. We're not there yet. You're still stuck with me. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of, uh, just one quote. Um, this is one of my favorite books of all time, uh, The Marketplace of Revolution. I wrote my master's thesis on creamware from Salem Maritime. Shout out Salem Maritime. And um, the consumption patterns and what it said about the person that was purchasing these goods. So I could talk a lot about this, but I won't bore you. I will let T.H. Breen sum it up much better than I could in a much smaller amount of time. Each year, the volume of imports increased, creating by 1750 a virtual empire of goods. In, in the colonial marketplace, in which dependency was always an issue, imported goods had the potential to become politicized, turning familiar imported items such as cloth, and tea into symbolisms of imperial oppression. And since Americans from Savannah to Portsmouth purchased the same general range of goods, they found that they were able to communicate with each other about a common experience. 
Whatever their difference is, they were consumers in an empire that seemed determined to compromise their rights and liberties. Powerful, right? Um, I, I truly believe that um, this idea of want over need and accumulation of goods and people really change during this time. It's a time of enlightenment. It's a time of increased consumerism, increased production, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. There's a lot going on here. And I think consumerism plays a big role in that. And you see that reflected in the archaeological record. 17th century, people in Concord, they're getting some nice goods. They certainly don't have full sets of things. Um, by the mid to late 18th century in Concord, they had the access to these goods. They wanted to maintain that access. Um, so less dependence on the crown, more going on in here. Um, but they still wanted to have, have that punch bowl on their table at the end of the day. So these are a few of my favorite sources. Um, there are so many more. And I would really like to thank all of you for coming and the Friends of Minuteman National Historical Park for this opportunity to speak, um, the Concord Free Public Library for the swanky room, the Concord Cultural Council, Northeast Museum Services Center, photography was all done by a volunteer, Norm Eggert, Dr. Mary Beaudry, may she rest in peace, was my advisor. Um, and I have the best co-workers, mentors, best friends in the Park Service. Um, I even met my husband in the Park Service. So I am eternally grateful to all of them. And just one more reminder that my email address is Nicole, not Nikki. So thank you. Thanks so much to Nikki for that great lecture. I think we learned a lot. And what I've definitely learned is that colonial drinking is a very popular topic. Here at Minuteman National Park, we've had um, a full room uh, two months in a row for the winter lecture series. Um, as Nikki mentioned, we'd like to thank our um, sponsors, Minuteman National Historical Park, the Concord Free Public Library, um, the Concord Cultural Council, um, and also Minuteman Media for being here today to record this lecture for those of you who are not able to join us in person. Um, I think Nikki could take questions now. And because we're being recorded, I'm going to ask Nikki to repeat the question into the microphone so that we catch the question and the answer for... Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, I hand it back to Nikki. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's a good one. They weren't. They were acquired. Um, so the majority of our history collection is 19th and 20th century. But the park did um, acquire and still, you know, occasionally does acquire 18th century objects that are not from our site. They're just... Um, of the period. So this, I believe, is from Bridgewater, Massachusetts, the, um, the fancy embroidered men's purse. And the Book of Psalms, I think, is more local, but I'd have to check it out. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be amazing. Um, Hartwell, I realized I didn't repeat the question, too. So the, um, <laughs> I got, I got it. I'll get it. Um, but so these, some of these objects were on exhibit. So you may be like, I remember this. Uh, but we have found things in buildings. If we were to find that in a building, I, you'd hear my scream from wherever you are. That would just be next level cool. But yeah, that was that was an acquisition. We have found fragments of handwriting, 18th century girls, I think, handwriting that says Elizabeth and practicing ABCs, which is just the best. Um, it's the best when you find things like that. I'm telling you, those, those are my favorite artifacts, the ones that really speak to you about the humanity of it all. Yes? You mentioned earlier that you found ceramics, a lot of those, but not so much as the metal. Was there a tank of things? Why is that? That's a great question. So why? do we find a lot of ceramics, but not necessarily the metal? Um, and for one, a lot of them didn't have lids. 
they just went lidless. They lived really recklessly, apparently, because I have two young children, so I couldn't imagine that. But if you were to break, say you dropped your tankard, you would salvage the metal pieces off of it, and you could attach it to another one. So um, yes, we were able to, you know, we had this consumerism, we were able to get goods, but it wasn't as fast as we necessarily wanted. So uh, there was still, we see a lot of repairs, especially on porcelain, um, and they probably would have re-retrofitted it. Well, they had pewter tankards, too. Um, yeah, we just don't happen to have any in our collection. If you go to Hartwell Tavern, they have lots of reproduction ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The fragments uh, that you found uh, in Cambridge, uh, is there any possibility of extracting DNA from these fragments to discover whether it was pure blood? That is a great question. The question was, the question was, <laughs> um, the wine, the possible Washington wine bottles, is there any way to extract DNA? Yes, however, um, this, these were done in 2001, um, which they had no idea in their minds in 2001 that we would be using DNA as readily as we are now. Um, I don't think that care was taken. I think everything was cleaned. Yeah, I think everything was scrubbed really clean, especially because it was in that mortar. Um, so unfortunately, that's, and like I said, they were excavated in 2001 now, so we've missed the window a little bit. But I don't know, in my heart, they were his. They were his. Yes. Uh, so the question is, at Hartwell Tavern at Minuteman, um, were we able to find things that related it to it being a tavern? And the simple answer, in my opinion, I haven't really gone through, I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of artifacts. No. Um, there is a ton of archaeology that talks about the 19th century occupation of that site. Um, but what has been done previously has not hit on any of those 18th century deposits, if they're even there. Um, so unfortunately, wouldn't that have made a great talk? Like talking all about the stuff we found at Hartwell. Um, there are some bottles um, there, but like I said, it's mostly later 19th century stuff. Yep. Yes. Can you say something about the usage of different vessels? Oh, yes. Yes, so the question was, were certain vessels used for certain types of drinks? And the answer is absolutely. And also, they just did whatever was easiest to. So yes, they had punch bowls, would have been for punch. Uh, I, I argue that you could have also used a punch bowl as a serving bowl in a pinch. Um, they had tankards, could have been used for um, like beer, cider, and then those stemware glasses were going to be mostly for wine. Um, the decanters are obviously for wine. But at the end of the day, I think they would have grabbed whatever was closest and just like a solo cup. Does that make sense? Um, things were more multi-purpose. And when we get into the Victorian period, everything has a name. Everything has a purpose. There's like 400 things on the table. That's um, when, when you kind of see more of that. But in the 18th century, yes, there were certain um, vessels for certain things. You had a posset pot, which was just for posset. Um, unfortunately, we would have been here for a really long time if I talked about all the different drinking vessels. But that's a, that's a good one. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so a good question in the um, Hogarth print right here, which is like, how do we not use this for this talk? Um, you can see the punch bowl in the middle. They do have pipes. Tobacco is quite common. We find so many ceramic pipe bowls and stems. Um, for those who don't know, it's what, right here what I'm talking about. I considered <laughs> having some of them in this talk, but it just got too big. Um, and I will say I did hope to get some 19th century stuff into this talk. Then I realized it was a whole separate talk about um, possibly Hawthorne's bottles 
over at the wayside, but that required a lot more research. So stay tuned for that one. Yes. You mentioned that the early English bottles were green. I was wondering if they knew why they made them green and how they made them green. So question was, they were the early English wine bottles were green. Why were they that color? Simple answer is just, it was easy to produce. That was the color that when they put the specific chemicals into the kiln, that's the color that it turned. It also saved wine from, from the direct light. So it was like a win-win. Um, it was kind of a natural phenomenon of co the color that they were using, the soda lime. Glass science is really hard. I'm not going to pretend I know it. But they, um, they also blocked the light. So that was another reason why. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. The question was the typical dimensions of a cider buck. Oh, a mug. mug. Oh, I was like, I don't even know what that is. Typical dimensions, this si like this big mm -hmm. with a handle. Okay. Yep. Typical dimensions of a cider mug. Any other? Oh. One more question. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the book that you mentioned? The one I read from? So powerfully. Thank you. The Marketplace of Revolution, How Consumer Politics Shaped American Independence by T.H. Breen. I also brought, for those of you who really wanted to learn more about the wine bottle dating, a guide to artifacts of colonial America. This was written in 1969 and is still um, something that I use all the time. Uh, Ivor Noel Hume worked in Colonial Williamsburg. A lot of what I know is because of this book. So it's another one. Are we doing any more? <laughs> what a good question to end it on. No, but I will say that the downtown Concord offers a plethora of places. So, it was also a good, oh, oh, good that was planned. It was a good setup, actually. Yeah. It wasn't planned, but it was a good setup. I, I forgot to mention um, that we have these um, Friends of Minuteman paper coasters. We thought this would be a fun giveaway for the um, theme of the winter lecture series, which was colonial drinking. So we have plenty of these um, on your way out if you want to grab a coaster or a couple. Um, to give away to friends and family. So thank you so much for coming today and thank you to Nicole for this wonderful lecture. <laughs> <laughs>